right, hello. I am uh, Kevin. I am Raven's editor. I am not very good at chess, and I have started a new account on chess.com to get a rating that Raven will then teach me to suck less. Uh, so I'm just going to jump right into it. E4, because that's all I ever do. It took a lot of time to really do nothing, as far as I can tell. I'm getting ready to castle, but not yet. Now if he castles, I have some free money. That's not free money, I fucked up. I messed up. I apologize. But yeah, if I move the knight, then I'll get my pawn for free. Oh, nice, I think I get a rook. Make him put his knight, I mean his rook, in the corner, doing diddly. I think I could take this pawn and get a free rook with my bishop. I can. Why would you offer me a draw? Get the hell out of here. I offered another draw. It's just sad. It's just sad that people live like this. I think I got him, folks. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Let's go! New 10 minutes, no review. I'm doing that later. French defense, the only one I know how to play. And that's putting it kind of generously, but the only one I do play. I feel like he's not playing this correctly, but I could be wrong. He castles queenside. I think I got a little trick for him. If he wants to mess up his pawns over there, that's fine with me. Chess is very stressful when you don't know how the game works. I think they're just going for a draw. Oh wait, I'm up three. When did I get up three? I have no idea when that happened. Nice. Maybe I can win. How cool would that be? Just take it, bro. Just take it. I think I can move here. <laughs> Will I be going 2-0? This is remarkable. This is remarkable. I don't know what these guys' ratings are, but I assume they're masters, at least an IM, so I must be quite good. Get the hell out of here. Get the hell out of here with that rook. Not in my house. I move over. If we trade them off, he's got nothing, and now he's got nothing. All he's got is poopy diapies. Let's keep trading, dog. It's over. You're finished. Two for two. Who'd have thought? Who'd have thought it's possible? All of my dreams are coming true. I always said I wish that I could go two for two. Will I go three for three, folks? Can I castle here? He takes the pawn. My rook, I can move out here after he takes and kind of attack him, but not really. Well, then he can't castle, so let's go for it. YOLO. Do I want my knight or my bishop more? I think the knight. It seems more annoying. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. It's not looking good, team. It is not looking good at all. Nah, it's over. I will resign. I got messed up. Two more to go. Back to the French. Back to my baby. Mon ami. <laughs> Trying to push this guy. Well, well, I completely fucked up. I'm an idiot. Completely messed up. My apologies. I'm very sorry. I'm just gonna resign. That one is bad. We're not talking about that game. That was bad. Let's go back home. I don't know what this guy's plan was, but... We might be up a little something here. We'll keep piling up on the night. We're piling up. No. We have to recover. Get out of my house with that. Threatening mate. Or threatening to capture this. Woo! Final rating. Let's see. 944. Not bad. Not great. 
Not, not the title I was hoping for, but could be worse. Well, that's it for now. Let's go see what Raven says. Hi, everyone. I'm Grandmaster Raven Sturt. This is my editor and close friend, Kevin. Hello. Um, he is not as good as chess as I am, and I'm going to be teaching him. I'm very excited to start this journey with him. Um, I think I'm going to be able to offer a very um, a large amount of useful insights into his game. Um, he's already played many games. He played five games. I'm looking forward to going over those games. And yeah, let's get into it. Um, so e4, d5. This is the Scandinavian defense, in case you don't know. Pawn takes, queen takes. Um, yeah, so king pawn is a bit more risky than queen pawn. Um, I think we'll leave you on king pawn from what, from what I saw from your games. You have uh, a relatively good understanding of king pawn stuff. Um, but just for those of you who don't know, I really don't recommend beginner players start with King Pawn because there are just so many different systems. You know, they can play Sicilian, they can play French, they can play Krokan. And the idea is that there's such a diverse um, variety of terrains that you have to to learn to to just go through and deal with. And it's it, it's very overwhelming for beginner level players to to just try to, to accumulate all of this different knowledge and these different openings. Um, meanwhile, for instance, Queen Pawn is super popular, and for good reason, because uh, you literally only need to know this, and you can play the London. Mm. It is it is a pretty uh, bad opening, which I honestly can't stand and loathe, but it makes a lot of sense why people learn it, because it's just so much easier to understand. Um, so knight c3, very good move. You're kicking the queen out. Queen e5 check. Queen e2. Um, in general, it's not good to trade queens, mm. especially if you're playing the white pieces. As white, you have the onus on you to, to really force your... Not force yourself, but to really force the play and be aggressive. And trading the queens, by its nature, simplifies the game and eases the problems. That makes like, sense. What would you do instead? Uh, probably bishop e2. You have a couple moves here. Um, I tell all my beginner students to pretty much never put their knights on these squares. Mm. What do you think? Why do you think it's a problem to put your knights on, like... So, yeah, just for reference, I'm talking about king 2 and queen 2 for, for either color. Yeah. Well, then the bishop's pretty locked in, and also that knight can't attack the queen. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, you more or less covered it. So, effectively, the bishop is completely blocked. The queen is also blocked in this case. Um, and more than that, the knights are only ever hitting one square in the center. Hmm. Yeah, so knights are pretty much perfect on these two squares. I call these... I'll try to find the proper squares. I usually call these the golden squares, but for the purposes of this video, I'll call these the blue squares. Yeah. Um, the one good thing about this knight here is that it does support the bishop coming out with a tempo. That makes sense. Yeah. That That's likely not to even really matter, because um, in this case, you're probably going to have to play d4 with a tempo anyway. Yeah. So the queen will already have been kicked by the time your bishop comes to f4. But I understand the general idea of what you're saying. Of no. why that's a bad square for the knight. Nice. So queen e2 takes, bishop takes, good move, keeping your knight open to the, the golden square. <laughs> <laughs> the red square. Knight f3, knight f6, bishop e5, bishop d7. You took. Um, this is a mistake. How much are bishops worth? Three. How much are knights worth? Three. That's wrong. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, yeah, bishops are technically worth three and a third. Um, most people are taught that both are worth three, and for good reason, for simplification's sake, normally it's the best way to think about things, but there is pretty much no reason to trade a bishop for knight unless you have a reason to. Mm. Um, so, like, if you're getting a good score in the center, for instance, if you're ruining their pawn structure, any sort of minor positional advantage makes sense in terms of trading a bishop for a knight, but if, if there's n literally no positional basis for doing so, you shouldn't do it. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, so in this case, this move is doubly bad. First of all, you're trading off a bishop for a knight, which is a mistake. Secondly, you're activating their bishop. This bishop is waiting around here. This bishop is sitting on the bench, asking the coach to put him in. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> and after bishop takes, bishop takes, you just gave this bishop a star roll in the game. Dang it. So knight e5, bishop takes g2. Rook g1. So knight e5 is a bit of a blunder. Um, it, it drops the pawn. I don't think it's that much of an issue, though. Because you are getting your knight in a good position. And um, 
Especially in these lower level situations, dropping a pawn like this at the cost of some activity, while objectively it's a little incorrect, it's only a really slight disadvantage and it's only slightly diminishing your, uh, your potential. Normally at lower levels, going for extreme activity is a great thing. Because you're going to see just people drop lots of pieces, and when people drop lots of pieces is... Or how do I phrase this properly? People drop lots of pieces when the other side has a lot of activity. So while technically, objectively, a computer would defend this position perfectly and just beat you, you're maximizing your practical chances by getting positions with just enormous activity. Yeah, and yeah, makes sense. Plus, the more complex, the more players like me are just going to botch it. Yeah, yeah. Boshing is, that's a, that's a good word for this. <laughs> I love when my opponents botch their queens. <laughs> <laughs> so e6, bishop b2, bishop b4, castles. You could have always taken this pawn. By the way, this, this was here for the taking. Mm. A good question to ask yourself whenever your opponent moves a piece is what were they defending before? Um, yeah, a simplistic form of it is just ask yourself what they're forgetting. Whenever they make a move, they're... they're controlling new scores and they're forgetting old ones yeah in this case we both forgot that one yeah me, me and jason from china <laughs> jason oz yeah so castles castles you caught it this time though in this case he's forgetting the f7 square and you took you got a nice fork <coughs> takes takes 84 you snatch this you took here and he takes f2 you kicked him out 94. So at the moment you're already winning, and I'm really impressed by this tactic you found. Bishop is x-raying the rook, and you found rook takes c7, which is a very good move. Um, I think for... I, Over the years I've probably taught... I don't know, I would estimate maybe 3,000 lessons to students of a relatively beginner level. This is a very good sign that Kevin is finding moves like this. Um, I think at lower levels... <laughs> I think at lower levels it's really... Um, these moves are really invisible, and the idea of spotting this type of tactic with the rook hanging in the corner, it's a good sign. I'm optimistic about Kevin's growth. So king takes, bishop takes rook, knight d6, c4, um, bishop e4. We haven't talked about this yet because we've been mo mostly focused on tactics, but uh, a good method for setting up your pawns is always to set them up against your opponent's minor pieces. Yeah. Or almost all the time. So what you want to do is you want to set... Your, your pawn's up sort of like a tree. So to dominate the knight, you would want to put your pawns here and here. And the idea is that then the knight would not be able to go to any of these squares. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. You could lock them down. Yeah. And it would, it would be doubly working against the bishop as well. You want to set your pawns up on light squares. Yeah, I think I was just in too much of a rush to get... I want to, like, get this uh, knight pushed back, so I was rushing it. But yeah, I could see how moving the, to d3 first is a stronger move. Yeah. In general, you, I, my style is one of like suffocation, and in general, that's um, that's the method that most grandmasters use. If you look at Hikaru's games and a lot of these grandmasters games, um, they might sound super tactical, they might sound super aggressive, but actually, almost all of them apply this this method of just suffocation, where you're just stopping your opponent from any active ideas, and then you're slowly going for these more aggressive. Yeah. First, you want to stop them from advancing at all, and then you want to slowly encroach and force them back. Yeah, I was just in a rush when, if I slowed down, I could see it's just significantly better. Yeah, you were too full of the vinegar. I was too full of the vinegar. C4, bishop e4, c5. Yeah, see, the thing is, is now that they have these weak squares, they can hop in. Yeah. They can hop into the house. Knight b5, king b2. Bishop d3. Yeah, so this is exactly what my, like, the that recommendation was trying to avoid. Um, in this position, uh, to be clear, like, there is always a hierarchy to, uh, to, to priorities and to just how to evaluate a position. In this case, you're up a rook to a bishop, so these positional considerations don't even really matter. You should be winning no matter what. Um, but if the differential was less, if both sides had more or less equal material, then this mismanagement of your pawns would have really cost you. Yeah, I could see it. Yeah. So this this is a classic example of what I call disjointed pawns. Um, do you know what a continuous function is in math? No. A continuous function is pretty much a line that never breaks. Okay. You want your pawns most of the time like that. Oh, I understand. So you want your pawns either adjacent diagonally or adjacent uh, horizontally. Yeah. For some reason, I really wanted the rook on f7 and getting check, but <laughs> I could see it doesn't really accomplish anything, as the game will show. <laughs> yeah, check doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. Um, so yeah, going according to like the theory, 
of that continuous function, you have three breaks here, right? You have a break here and a really deep break here. Yeah. Um, your opponent doesn't have enough material to really target these things, but if their pieces were more active and they had better material on the board, they would be able to target both of these. Makes sense. These would both drop like apples. So check, king c6, bishop g7, king takes c5, or takes b7. I think the way the rest of the game turned out, you handled this quite well. Um, you took here, which is fine. For simplicity's sake, you definitely could have taken here at this point. That would, I mean, the, the rationale in this case would just be it's simplifying to a much more straightforward type of position. I should add that in general, at lower levels, finding knight forks and dodging knight forks is particularly tricky, mm. as a, a later game will <laughs> evidence. And so for that reason, um, that is actually one rationale for trading a bishop for knight, just uh, for simplicity's sake and for avoiding any potential knight forks. Takes king before. Yeah, here you should have asked yourself the question of what, what is my opponent forgetting? You got too focused on the checks. King I love the checks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you could have also, you could have placed him in dire straits with rook a4. These two pieces are in a bit of trouble. They would have to play e5. Um, and I think after bishop g7, you would just be winning a pawn. He can't defend it with knight c6 because then the, the bishop would drop. That is a better series of events, but I don't get check, so I, that's why I didn't do that. Yeah. I want to check. Yeah. <laughs> Checks don't really matter. Oh, yeah, you I understand, understand that. Yeah. <laughs> you but understand. in the heat of the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was too full of the vinegar. Yeah. e5, rook e7, very good. Knight c6, rook e6, you got a pin. Oh my god, sorry. Excuse me. So you were here, king c7, rook f6, knight d8, uh, king a3. I think in general you're playing well. You missed some some ways to execute slightly better, but um, I mean the goal here is just uh, to win, so it, it's not really an issue. King a3, this is a very strategically sound move. You're just advancing these, these two connected pawns up the board. Bishop g7, knight e7, bishop f6. Um, yeah, this is good. Normally I say not to place your bishop and rook so close together because there's going to be some awkwardness here. But you are winning a knight, and so for that reason it's it's not an issue at all. So it takes rook c7, king f5. Um, I think you handled this quite well. You did miss an opportunity to, to end the game even quicker. If you play rook c8 and go for the queen, you're only going to be up a rook. Mm. If you just try to trade the rook for the bishop, you're going to be up a queen. That makes sense. So just, yeah, instead... I, I like to just hassle the bishop. Um, this would have been a really, really easy one if you just went this way. Yeah. You can just take, and that's the end of the game. Even if he plays king f3, just take, and you're going to make another queen. Yeah. Um, in this position, it doesn't really affect you at all, because in both cases you're winning the race, but there are cases in which their pawns are faster, in which case you would have to to use this, this method of just accelerating everything. Um... Other ways of doing it, by the way, would be to play like something like d3, and the idea is that wherever his bishop goes, there might be some tactic. Um, you would want to push his bishop somewhere onto a line of the king, so in other tactical situations, you would push the bishop here, and then you would get the check with the same idea. Yeah. A queen is better than a rook. Definitely. In my opinion. In everyone's opinion. <laughs> king h3. Uh, rook h8. I... Rook h8, okay, honestly, this wins. I'm definitely splitting hairs at this point. A much simpler one would just be rook g8. Yeah. Just cut the king off and throw this pawn up the board. They're, the king is never going to be able to get out and make a queen. Yeah. So rook h8, king g4. Um, I'm really, I'm wondering if I should offer any insight here, because you did, you did end up mating. You have a mate in two, though, with queen g8. Right, they're in zigzag. They have to step down, and then you have checkmate. That is a, a lot less moves than I ended up taking. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a lot for you to learn, so it's it's really unclear if I should be splitting hairs like this. Um, all right, very nice, very clean game. Let's go on to this game. So here you are playing Tormentor twenty eight. He's good from America. E forty six. You like the French? I love the French. We're going to deal with that. <laughs> it's good. Um, honestly, in, in terms of what I was saying, I think the French is definitely a second-rate system. I've tried playing it. it. I've easily had the worst results in it, but that's mostly due to the fact that I was inexperienced in it. 
Um, I was trying to play a very complicated variation in it. Um, the time period I'm describing is two years ago when I was still in the in pursuit of the Grandmaster norms, and um, I had a lot of trouble with this type of variation here. Have That's a very common, yeah. I would say that even at my level, yeah. When I was playing a little bit more chess, at like you know, twelve hundred rating. Nice. What What did you normally play? Did you play knight f six here or bishop b four? Both are bishop b four. Yeah, bishop b four is really dicey. Um, I think, as we're gonna get to later, I think it would be a fantastic idea for you to learn because the the games here and the results are really determined by who has more experience. Um, yeah, and as evidenced by my play. Uh, I just was much less experienced than my opponents in these systems, and I just got destroyed. My my record in these positions was, was horrendous. I think... I don't even think I won a single game. I played, like, 15 games. That's pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> I played 15 games, I drew some, and I lost some, and I didn't win a single one. It was, it was not good. Is it that bad, like, for other people? Is it considered... Not no. bad for others. So that's the thing. It's actually not that bad. It's just that I was really irresponsible, and I thought that by just learning the variations and not understanding the ideas, yeah, that that would be acceptable at GM level. It was. It's really just. It was really naive thinking on my part. Um, I do actually. I do want to learn it at some point, but it's um. Yeah, for those who don't, if you don't want to really study an opening, do not play this. Um. I think for you, though, this is going to be a good recommendation, just because it's always determined by who has more experience among the two players playing, right? You're not yeah. going to... If you're playing GM-level players, then of course I wouldn't recommend this. But I think the putting in a tiny bit of time to study these variations is going to pay off massive dividends. I, I bet a lot of people at your level won't even realize that this pawn is hanging, for instance. Yeah. Because there is a pin here. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Sometimes you do get that, that free money. Yeah. Nice. Um, so yeah, going back, uh, the French defense is definitely a slightly second-rate system. Objectively, it's okay. Um, like, these days, more or less, any opening is equal. It's just, it's, it's, it's a matter of which opening do you have to really work harder to get the equality for, and in, in this situation, the French is one that you have to struggle a lot more to get equality, and normally, black has to play, like, 15 accurate moves at Grandmaster level. Um, if you were just starting out... Um, I still think that the French is a good system, though, because it, it goes back to that definition that I'm looking for. I just, you know, we want to really constrain terrain. We we don't want to have to cover that much territory in terms of your opening. That's why I think it's fun. It's like, it becomes super closed in, and I, I like that, kind of. It's not, like, super tricky. Like, I don't look out for forks or whatever. Like, and it's not chaotic. It's very tight. Yeah. Yeah, it's an easier system to play. Yeah. It's an easier system. There, um, I mean, as we're gonna see, if you as as you start playing, I think for the moment, even like this next four hundred or five hundred points, you're not gonna play anyone who really knows the theory here. At some point, though, you are gonna start to see that Black does face some strategic problems here. Yeah. Um, th the position that you're gonna eventually get is this one, which is really cool. Um, the whole idea is that in this position, White gets a really ugly structure, but you've given up by far your best bishop. Yeah. And it's, it leads to a really chaotic situation. They, they play their queen here and they start going for this. Um, that's a sneak preview of what will come maybe in a few months after our lessons. I don't think we're going to need to worry about that anytime soon. Um, but yeah, for now, I think it's a fantastic system. So knight of 3, d5, takes, takes, queen e2, check. Yeah, this is a very bad move on your opponent's part. He should not be doing that. You responded properly. Bishop e7, do not put the queen in front of the bishop because... As we're going to see in his in his situation, he's not going to be able to castle anytime soon. Knight c3, c5. You really love doing this. <laughs> the c5 move. I do. Why? Uh, well, <laughs> really I usually would do it if there's a pawn on d4, but there wasn't. But usually I would, what I want to do in the French when I play it is pressure the, knight, the bit pawn on d4 until it, like with my knight or whatever, until it is, it takes on c5, and then I could take with my bishop if it's not already gone, and then I have a sweet bishop on that file. Oh, like, okay. You want to get a bishop here? Yeah, I want to get a bishop on uh, c5, ideally. Nice. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking. So on the one hand, c5 makes sense, but it's um, I think it's a lot less strategically problematic for them than this move. It's important to think of pawns as a trench. 
right? Pawns are, are in a trench, they move head on. It's yeah. exactly like trench warfare in World War One, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you're a history buff, so oh, yeah. I'm trying to make it relatable. And yeah, for instance, if they played, if they had played d4 instead, you would never be able to advance your pawn, right? Why do I call it like trench warfare? Because this pawn can't advance, and this one is heavily limited, right? This one technically, the one on its side can advance technically, but it's always going to have to worry about some pawn just capturing. Mm -hmm. So the pawns get more or less stuck. If there's no front line established, then you need to understand that it's more or less free game. Mm -hmm. Now, what does a move like this do? You are spending a tempo, so normally it's important to do this only if you're getting a, a winning a tempo back. If you're doing this when you're not attacking a piece, normally it's not worth the squeeze. Mm -hmm. um, but here you're kicking the knight out. Do you, re do you remember what the square is? The golden square. It's the golden square. Yeah, exactly. You're kicking a knight out of a golden square, and wherever the knight goes, it's going to really suffer. If the knight goes here, it's just completely blocked in by this pawn. Makes sense. Um, this is a surprisingly simple... Um, operation, and yet it's extremely effective. Mm. Um, the one thing you do need to worry about is that definitionally, by pushing your pawn closer to your opponent, it is becoming more vulnerable. So, especially in a case like this, if they play knight b5, it would be important that we would be able to build concrete. Yep. Yeah, I probably might, I might have rushed in that situation. My initial instinct is to like attack the knight, but then I have to remember yeah, that pawn's hanging until I defend it. Yeah. The idea, though, is this knight is really wobbly here. Yeah. It's extremely wobbly. You're going to be able to kick it further. Um, and I guess we rushed through this point, but this is another... I think I already alluded to it a bit. Pawns defending other pawns are the perfect type of... Uh, I'm not sure even what you would call it, but it's the, the ter perfect type of front line because only one pawn is ever a target. This pawn is completely invulnerable. They could attack this with a million pieces. They would only ever be getting two pawns for it. Yep. So, you know, three is more than two. No piece is ever going to be worth this investment. Um, just to show you a bit of how we could continue here, let's say they play d3, which would be a normal developing move to develop this bishop. We would want to put this knight in what I call jail by playing this. And now we're building that famous tree against the knight. The yep. knight has nowhere to go here. Um, notice in that other example, the knight was close to the center, and so the knight still had some options. The farther the knight is away from the, the center, um, the farther the more effective this is in just completely, um, for lack of a better word, crippling the knight. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Like, for instance, if we put the knight here, in this case, um, just to show you what I mean, let's just build it in a slightly different scenario. Of course, this would be a really ugly move here. It takes away the golden square, but I just want to show what would happen with this knight. Um, we set it up here. The knight technically, in this type of isolated zone, the knight technically would still have these other options. It's just due to the fact that we have this other concrete here that the knight can't go here. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea is that um, if the knight is in this zone, then it's not going to be as handicapped by us building the tree. It's still going to be limited, but it's not going to be completely handicapped. Mm -hmm. I call this the outer center. These are the 16 squares on the board. This is including the, the, the immediate center as well. These are the 16 squares on the board where a knight has 8 options. Notice as soon as the knight steps out, even this knight, for instance, it can't go over here. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. These are really simple definitions, but at the same time, they're, they're really important to uh, digest. Um, I've worked on these concepts a lot with students, and as they start to understand them, you would be surprised at how, how easily, how, how effectively this, this can guide your thinking toward the right positional decisions. No, already, like... Oftentimes at my level, it seems like I'm not thinking things through. I don't have the skills to think it through very articulately. So just having any sort of rule nice. that, you know, I could actually understand it in easy language actually helps a lot. And it makes, it's not that hard to understand what you're saying. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, a big guy on, I'm big on rules. Yeah. <laughs> I like rules. Raven's rules. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um... You know, I, honestly, though, I think rules really help expedite thinking, and especially, uh, even at my level, by the way, like, this is going sort of off on a tangent, but I expected when I made GM to start, like, thinking super complicated, super deep theory, and it was the opposite. It turned out that I had just learned how to think in simpler terms, but make that really effective at coming to correct decisions quickly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, simple is not easy to do. Yeah. So I understand, I believe easily that the better you get, you actually become simpler in a lot of ways. Yeah, 
And also just in terms of even classical chess for my GM norms, I needed to play nine round tournaments at game 90, but game 90 is not that much time actually. You can only, like if you're thinking deeply about a position and that takes 20 minutes, at that rate you would only have time for four moves. Yeah. So you need to be able to expedite the process significantly and just for the bulk of your moves, maybe 80% of the time, just be able to go off intuition and some basic uh, calculations. Nice. So c5, d3, knight f6. So even here you could have played d4. Mm -hmm. As long as the, the front line hasn't been established, as long as the pawns have not met each other and one is touching up against each other, you should always think about the fact that the pawns are exponentially more flexible than they will be once they've met. Mm -hmm. Bishop g5, castles, takes, takes. That's a mistake. He's, uh, he's trading your bishop. Um, he's trading a bishop for a knight. Yeah, this this trade is a really terrible move positionally. Um, first of all, he's trading bishop for a knight, which is not good. He's trading his good bishop. Do you know what that is? Uh, the one that's not blocked in? Uh, sort of. It's more or less, we look at where he's put his pawns. He's placed his pawns on light squares, so whatever's opposite this color okay. is technically the good bishop. This is only slightly the good bishop, because there's only one more pawn on a light square than a dark square. But even so, um, like as we can see from this position, his dark squares are a bit weaker. Yeah. So that's why the bishop is more important. Um, and thirdly, this bishop was extremely disharmonious here. Um, this bishop was blocking your rook. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess because this is the first lesson, we have to talk about so many definitions, but there's, um, there's an interesting framework for evaluating pieces. There's activity, vulnerability, and harmony. Um, activity is normally the one you want to only, almost only focus on. Activity is like 95% of it. Um... So I'm only really telling you about these other dimensions just so that you start to be aware that they even exist. Don't, mm -hmm. don't worry about applying this. Um, activity is pretty much everything a piece is doing. That includes attack and defense. It, it goes against the normal definition. The general, like, the, the universal definition of activity is only what you're doing aggressively. Mm -hmm. So this definition technically does not um, comport with it. But um, for, for the purposes of this, that's what it is. Vulnerability is how attackable it is. Mm. Um, and harmony is how much it blocks your other pieces. So if we look at, I'm trying to find a good piece. This, this would be a perfect piece. This piece is super active. Mm -hmm. It's aggressive. It's also super vulnerable. The farther they go up their position. So I actually, I put, I more or less have this diagram in my course. Um, the closer they get to us, the more vulnerable they are. Makes sense. Yeah. They're just the easier it is for them for us to attack it because they're closer to our pieces. Yep. Um, it's more vulnerable. It's also slightly unharmonious because it's blocking the knight. Okay. But only slightly. Yeah. Only very slightly. This bishop is is actually active, right? It's defending. Mm -hmm. It's defending. It's defending some things. It's not the most active piece in the world, but it is doing some useful things. Um, maybe a simpler way of thinking about it is usefulness, vulnerability, harmony than activity because yep. it's when people hear activity it just gets too confusing people think only of aggressive like just super aggressive just out out in the center dominating the whole board type of thing um this is very useful it is actually quite vulnerable because it's on an open file mm -hmm. long term and it's very disharmonious as well for that same reason it's going to be blocking our rook so this is a really terrible trade on their part because they're improving our bishop exponentially yep dramatically so queen d2, rook e8, bishop e2, bishop g4, very good. Um, a6, what what was that move about? Uh, I think just stopping the knight from moving there. But if the knight comes, you can just kick it out. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, remember the definition. This is the best zone for the knights. Um, it's counterintuitive, but actually if they were, like, so if you played knight c6, if they were to play knight b5... A lot of my students get into situations like this because this is one of the classic tricks that everyone like learns. We will see in yeah. the next game. <laughs> that everyone learns starting out. So long as they don't have this trick, you can more or less just leave the knight there. Yeah. It's not a good square. Sooner or less, sooner or later, at um, at Grandmaster level, you're going to see this, that if a Grandmaster has a knight here, the other Grandmaster isn't even going to bother wa like wasting time. The, the Grandmaster who's put his knight here will waste his time fixing it and moving yeah. it back. I guess like what's going on also is like... I could be, I guess, maybe too passive or something where go back to the last position. Mm -hmm. Or when did I move? What what part? The part where I moved the, the pawn. There we go. Yeah. 
Like, I just don't see, like, a clear way to attack, so I just think, like, what's a minor improvement I can make to my side of the board? Okay. But I don't have, a, like, a specific plan or anything. It just seems like a safe move that's, like, it does make the pawn better, and I don't know what else to do. Uh, well, the, like, are these pieces on their best squares? No. Yeah. There you go. Man, it makes sense. There you go. You always want to be going for your, the largest return yeah. on your position. Possible. Technically, this would improve your position slightly, but definitely not to the extent that knight c6 or queen d7, or even rook e7 for that matter. Long term, your rook should be doubled on the e file. Yeah, I but, do. I do know that, but I guess yeah. No, what you're saying makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the a very simple rule for the rooks is just put them on the open file. Yeah. Um. Nice. So a6, h3. Yeah, I think he would have been in extreme trouble if you played knight c6. You already are starting to have a lot of ideas. Like, if they were to play knight b5, um, this pawn would be hanging, for one thing. Um, you could also just lock the knight out of the center, then. Yeah. D4. And then you would be able to build the jail again. Um, the reason why you would be want to be a little hesitant of this now is that the knight can go into the center. Mm -hmm. If the knight can hop further into the center, then you haven't inconvenienced the knight at all. And in this case, you've just made your bishop really bad. You've just blocked it. So, yeah, I think knight c6 would have been a good move. You have a lot of interesting ideas here. I'm waiting for this knight to move. You have a really cool idea of taking and playing knight d4 with this pin here. That would be cool. Yeah. So a6, h3, bishop h5, very good, don't trade. a3, d4, uh-oh. <laughs> you were just too full of the vinegar. I was too late with that one. Yeah. Maybe eight moves ago would have been good. Yeah. Um, yeah, d4 does not work here at all because of knight e4. Yeah. Just leave it there. Yeah. It is a little uncomfortable, right? You you don't like the fact that your queen has to, to cover this pawn. Um, so yeah, if you played c5 without planning on going d4 so soon, you should have helped this pawn back so you could play c6 and build a classic tree. Mm -hmm. So d4, knight e4. Um, yeah, knight c6 would have been better. At this point, it's probably around equal. B6, yeah, you love moving your pawns, don't you? I do. Just, uh... This pawn is actually a bit vulnerable. Probably the best move is to play knight d7. You need to get developed, though. B6 takes, takes. This is probably a mistake on his part. I just said about how uh, bishops are better than knights. Mm -hmm. This bishop is awful, though, and more than that, it's blocking your position. Your queen is begging to... Your queen would be really happy to come on this square because it would be out of the way of the rooks. Long term, the queen needs to move because the rooks will, will have to come in sooner or later. Yeah. And um, the queen would be pressuring f3. It would be pressuring a lot of things. Um, yeah, this move really facilitates your development. Uh, I've been yeah I've been thinking about this question a lot. A good rule of thumb is your queen should aim for this type of trapezoid. Just in general. Because yeah. the thing is, is the, the further out you go, the more vulnerable you are. Until the until a lot of pieces have been traded, this is generally the safest area for your queen to also stay out of the way of the other pieces. Yeah. So knight e4, b6, takes, takes, rookie one, knight c6, knight g5. That was a big blunder. This queen is um, accruing too many liabilities that it has to defend. I think I take advantage of it if I remember correctly. I was pretty proud of... Yeah, you played well. Yeah, I, I like this move. You took... That was big brained. Yeah. Uh, well, I, technically it's incorrect, though. He can get his knight out of the way. He could play knight e4 and attack your queen. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you almost had him. How um, do I do that? Is there a way to, that I could have done that to uh, get the you, knight? You would have to trade it the other way, right? You need you need whatever's here to be attacking something. So yeah. takes, takes, and now if they play knight e4, you could just snatch their queen. Yeah. And they would be able to get a queen for knight back, but in the end they lost so much material. Yeah. Yeah, I would be more up there than I was in my game. Yeah. Yeah, and the big difference here is that they could throw this move in immediately. And if you move your queen, you lose the bishop just the same. But here you could take. Yeah. And they would take back. And the the material configuration is a bit strange. But you've gotten two pieces for a rook, which should be a winning advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So takes, takes, takes. Knight e4 was too big brain for him, though. <laughs> and he played queen takes. You took there. H6, very good move, dodging the checkmate. No tricks today. No. Nope. Queen f3, rook c8. 
queen g4. That's a terrible move on his part. Uh, he's just allowing you to simplify, making the, the position a lot easier. Takes, takes. You played some very strong moves. Um, I have a lot of confidence. Um, I, I guess at the end of the video, I'll talk a bit about what my goals are for you, but I'm very con this is a very strong move. Nice. Like, most people just do not play this way. You're going to bring your rook to e8. Oh, yeah. Get the hell out of my house. This sounds super logical, but at lower levels, th this type of move is rarely seen. Nice. Rook e4, rook e8, rook f4. Rook e2, good. You know what they call this? Nope. They call this the Bay of Pigs. Because nice. uh, you're just you're going into the seventh rank. Maybe it's not the Bay of Pigs. Maybe I'm thinking of something else. But it's like the there's something that they they teach they taught us in primary school about this. I, I I forget what it. I think it's the pig on the seventh, and it's just eating from the trough. I like that. Yeah. Whatever it is, I like being in that position. Yeah. Like getting those free pawns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to be the greedy pig. Yeah. So here, um, you miss that the knight can just take. I got too excited <laughs> about the pawns. <laughs> You were too busy at the trough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was too greedy of a pig. <laughs> Rook d5. Um, I really, I, I have to say, like, okay, you are making some mistakes. I really like your style, though. You have a super dominating style. You're focused now on just completely limiting the rook by playing king e7. Um, rook f5, you play g6. Rook b1, king h2, rook e1. Yeah, you have a very dominating style. You're just making sure that this rook cannot get active at all. Yeah, I was uh, consciously thinking, like, let's trade off these rooks or get rid of this rook, and then I definitely win with all, yeah. this, all this advantage I have. Like, I'm plus five. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think we're going to get along perfectly, because uh, this, this is exactly my style. Nice. Yeah. F3, king e6, king g3. Rook e5. I think this is a waste of time. Yeah, I don't know why I was doing that. I can't even remember. You should force the issue. Play g5. If He could either trade the rooks, or if he plays rook f5, he gets bamboozled. Yeah, I was planning on doing that, that the whole time, so I don't know why I took the time to do that. Waste of time. Yeah. Rook e5, king f2, g5. Oh, okay, so you just wanted to force the trade a different way. So takes, takes, and... Very nice, yeah, just bring your king in. Now it's over. Mm -hmm. uh, probably just slightly better is to take with the knight and keep your king active, but this... We're splitting hairs. It's really... Nice. Alright. Very good game. Now it goes downhill, unfortunately. You got, uh... <laughs> you got wrecked. <laughs> uh, Alright, so e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4. Uh, I also agree with this, um, this opening. We want to go for a relatively simple opening that you can apply in a lot of games and there's not that wide a variety. The scotch, um, the scotch is a bit complicated, that's what this is called, mm -hmm. by the way. Um, it is a bit complicated, but on the whole it's so much less complex than bishop c4 or bishop b5 that I think this is a great choice for you. Nice. So b4 takes, knight takes, bishop e7. This is a pretty bad move. The bishop should be more active. Um, modern theory indicates either bishop c5 or knight f6 are the best tries here. You play bishop e5. This is probably technically slightly incorrect. There's no need to put the bishop here. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, not... The, the, the pawn's still there, so they're not pressuring anything. Yeah, and more than that, um, like, these knights are likely to trade anyway, and if your bishop is left there after the trade, they're just going to be able to kick you out. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So bishop b5, a6, bishop a4, b5, bishop b3, knight f6, you castle it here, that's a fine move, knight takes e4, rook e1, knight c5, and uh, yeah, this position, this is interesting, on the one hand you dropped a pawn, I think you should have perfect play though, there's a lot of pressure here. Yeah, I was very consciously thinking of... I'm giving up a pawn, but I'm gonna. I pretty much I could force him to not be able to castle. Yeah, yeah, that's what you went for. I think this definitely was worth it here. Um, then I had like a free pawn after I did it, and I, I missed that. Maybe that's where it went wrong. I'm not totally sure, but I, I think I was happy after this position, and then kind of after on I got lost and didn't know how to like capitalize on it. Yeah, I think um, 
Knight f5 might have been interesting. The idea is that you're attacking this, and if they give you time for bishop d5, you're just going to win material. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that they could take this, which would be a good trade on paper, but then you can take here. Um, your knight is hanging, your rook is hanging, we're just going to sacrifice the rook with this move, and it looks like you, you're you winning. Um, That's pretty, like, uh, to be honest, like, it, I would not see this in a million years. But it's, it does look cool, but I would never see... That's so many levels of... I'm a simple man. <laughs> <laughs> a simple man with simple tastes. Yeah, that's, I get what you're saying, but not to argue, but I would just never see that ever. Okay. You had a lot of cool wins, though. Like, if knight takes, you could check here and here, and you have checkmate, for instance. That is very cool. Um, or if here, they go here, check, here. Um, you got a lot of different checkmates here, because you just have too many threats. You have this threat, this threat, this threat. Um, the coolest one would probably be check here, takes, and then mate. That is... Uh, yeah, I like that. Yeah. You could have gotten all the glory. I got nothing in the end. <laughs> um, yeah, this would have been interesting. They could play king here, but then you would just double down on the attack. And it looks like it's over, but the, the game still actually goes pretty tricky. They play d5, they're attacking your queen. I, really, I don't know what's going on, honestly. Like, you could play you could play this move with check. They play here, and the whole... The whole saving grace here is that if you take, hitting their queen, and threatening all these checkmates, they take here and they're threatening your queen. I really don't know what's going on. I, I would assume you're winning. I really have no clue. Both me and my opponent <laughs> at this level, if we got these positions, would have no idea what's going on or what to do. Me and my opponent both would be in way over our heads. You didn't see this? No. <laughs> I did not. <laughs> it's simple. You're right. Now I see it. I'll do this in my next game. <laughs> um, Alright, so knight takes, takes, you traded. Here you missed an option. You should probably get this bishop out of the way. It'd make perfect sense to take here. That's why I said that's that's maybe where it kind of started to go wrong. I think that's like the clear advantage I got from the position, and I didn't take it. Yeah, you botched it. Yeah. Because eventually the king just sits back behind that pawn, and it's like completely safe. Hmm. So he played 96. This is probably a bit of a blunder. He should just trade this off while he has the chance. There's a famous saying that um, in king's pawn's position, this is your best piece. Hmm. This bishop just tends to always be good on one diagonal or another. Hmm. And so for that purpose, if he can ever get the trade of a knight for this king's bishop, that's going to be a good deal in king pawn positions. Um, Alright, so c5. So he moved his knight back. You brought your knight out. c5. You traded. You got anything to say about this? I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> you botched it. I did. Um, yeah, don't trade the bishop for the knight. You could check. And I like your position here, actually. You know, you're down a pawn, but the, their king is in the center. Um, because queens are not on the board, you can't play for checkmate. But even so, the king is still enormously disharmonious. It's blocking the rooks. It's going to seriously mess with his coordination. I, I guess, like, looking at it now, what I may have been thinking, I can't say for sure, is, like, I might be scared that the bishop on b3 is going to get locked in. You know, just if the pawn pushes to c4. That's definitely true. Um, I, I like to, um, when I go over this with my students, I liken it to Indiana Jones running out of the temple. Mm. When they push a pawn here like this, they're, they're trying to entomb you in the Temple of Doom, yeah. but your bishop can dodge the boulder in the nick of time. Yeah. And you can play bishop d5, you know, you, you got out right before the door shut, and you're about to make it out alive with all the, the treasure. Nice. Um, you have a lot of threats here, you're attacking the rook, you're threatening check, you would have every reason to, uh, to be confident that you would be playing for a win here. Yeah, um, now I can see that it is actually a very good position, that I, is much better than trading the bishop. Yeah. Your pieces are so good here, I, I, you know, we don't have the computer on here, I wouldn't doubt that you're better. Yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah. It look, from the looks of it, this knight is probably the best placed piece in their position. Um, so after they, they defend this bishop from the knight trade, you should probably work to just kick it out with f4, f5, mm -hmm. or something of that sort. Um, yeah, maybe this isn't the exact move. I'm wondering what, what exactly you would do here. Pretty much, the thing is, is both of their rooks are really out of the game, so you would want to strike quickly in some way. 
Um, and to strike quickly, you need to start opening up squares. So you need to go for some type of trades. Your rooks need to get active. Mm -hmm. a, a move that would make a lot of sense is bishop d7. You're just trading the pieces, but your rook is getting on that 7th rank to start. That does look good. Yeah. you you got to start feeding from the trough at some point. Because the, the rooks do end up being pretty useless because I don't get them going. Yeah. Yeah, this is... Honestly, this is quite a more advanced concept. The The concept here is that you have rooks on open files, but as long as you don't have entry points, you can't do anything with them. Yeah. So, okay, so you... Yeah, so this... Let's go back. So bishop takes e6, takes... Check. Even here, believe it or not, you're probably still fine, but you need to, at this point, act extremely quickly. Strategically, you're playing with an enormous risk, because you're down a pawn and they have two bishops. Yeah. H3. Um, they played b4. You played knight e4. So h3 was a... h3 is probably incorrect. It's not appreciating time properly. You need to go for quick um, pressure with knight e4. What about knight to d5? Would that be fine? That would also be good. Yeah, because then you're trading off maybe one of the bishops. Yeah, no, and the other thing as well is that um, this bishop is not secure at all here. Yeah. They need, this bishop was really critical here because it was guarding all the pressure. Pawns are always the best defender, so it's this this type of defense that he really wants. This is not cushioned at all, and I would venture black is already losing here. Yeah. There's just too much pressure here. Like, if they play rook d8, you can just double up with rook e5, and threats of this are enormous. Yeah, I can see that this all looks much better than what actually happened. Yeah, this is this is a tricky position for them. Knight d5 could be good, and the idea is you just need to go for some type of resolution quickly. Like, if bishop d6, it leads to a weird position, but you could try something like this, right? Takes, takes, takes. Um, technically, you're slightly worse here, because they have two bishops against a rook and pawn, but you should have extremely good drawing chances. Um, another way to do this, there should be tons of resolutions here. You could also go to just harass this bishop. With knight f4. Yeah. You need to just use this next few moves quickly, right? If you don't do anything and you allow them to play, I don't know, like bishop d6, king e7, and rook d8, you're going to be dead lost. Yeah. So h3, b4. That That's a really big mistake as well, strategically. They need to just go for that aforementioned plan. Knight e4. They took on a2. This is the, the classic Fisher blunder. You know what I'm talking about? No. You, know, you don't? I don't know. No? There's a famous World Championship game where he takes a pawn like this, and it's known as like a beginner level mistake. Um, but yeah, he did it against Spassky for some reason. He just um, he got too excited, and then in the process, he ended up um, losing. Hmm. And it's just known as like the the Fisher blunder because it's uh, for someone of his caliber, he was the best player in the world. He was like dominating. This was when he was 2780 in the 70s, which was incredible, and. Uh, yeah, he just made this beginner level mistake. Yeah, I can see like it's just at this point in the game it's a useless piece that he's capturing essentially. Um, so like to lose tempo for it is probably not correct. I think you're you're missing the whole point. You've probably never seen this idea then. Just B three. The bishop is dead. That makes it even more than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Wow, I'm surprised Fisher did, that is crazy that he did that. <laughs> That's like so bad. Yeah. Yeah, there are a lot of crazy things about it and um the other thing is is um like maybe you could show even some clips of the the game briefly in the video but it's just um yeah the game is actually still drawn in the the one that um i'm talking about but he needs to find like the superhuman defense after it but for some reason it's just an equal ending and he chooses to take his pawn <laughs> but that's yeah that's bad he just went crazy it's it was a really crazy situation too because this was like the first game off of his uh stretch of like playing at like 2900 performance wise yeah this is after he, like, 6-0'd uh, Larson and 6-0'd Timonov, and then, uh, what was it, 6.5, 2.5 Trojan. And he goes in and does <laughs> yeah. this. <laughs> that is pretty funny. Yeah, really strange character. Did he ever say, like, anything about why he did that? I would, no, I would love to hear why. Yeah, like, like what he was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then he still ended up winning the world championship. Yeah. Imagine that. So takes, um, yeah, so b3 would have just won on the spot. Yeah. This is a really rookie level mistake. I'm, I'm surprised Riptide <laughs> allowed you <laughs> to do this. b3 would just be the end of the game. The bishop, not only not only is the bishop trapped, but also he's lost his cushion on the e-file. So his king is about to be um, just barbecued alive, pretty much, on the e-file here. I would assume that probably the best move 
is not even to worry about this bishop. The bishop is not going anywhere. Um, he needs to play rook d8 immediately. If he tries to fix the bishop with something like a5 to play a4 and undermine this pawn to eventually get the bishop out, I would assume something like bishop takes is the end of the game. Yeah. You're just going for an attack like takes. This really looks like there should be some tactic here to immediately win. Like, there should be some sort of checkmate even. Like, takes here, king f8. Okay, I mean, of course there are tons of wins here. But yeah, it looks terrible for them, so... Yeah, I was hoping I was hoping that there would be some type of, uh, like, um, like, back rank mate trick or something. I don't see one at the moment, but, um... Hmm. Even rook d7 would be enormous. Just rook e7, this is going to end the game. Yeah. We don't even need to worry about this bishop, actually. The, these tricks are going to be way too much. Anyway, so you took here. They played bishop e7, or sorry, bishop e6. Yeah, with this bishop here, they've cushioned everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the big thing, right? It's just that this pawn is defending it. You can never, even if you undermine that bishop, you're only ever going to be getting a pawn for it. Yeah. That's the whole problem. It's just such a low level of return on investment for so much time that you would have to expend to break through it. So takes, takes. That's that's another mistake. Um, this king is misplaced. Yeah. You should not voluntarily help them fix this issue. Um, probably better would just be rook e3. You're just preparing to double up. And when eventually these bishops do get traded, you're in perfect position to break through the cushion in the most aggressive fashion possible. Yeah, I was not thinking at all of how the how bad the king was placed, especially like not connecting the rooks. And I now I see it, and it makes like good sense that don't let them do that for free because they want to get that off that file so bad, and I just let them do it. Nice. Yeah, this rook on on um. This rook can get in the game by a d8. This rook is completely out of the game. Yeah. He's more or less playing down a rook. So bishop takes e7, king takes e7, knight c5, a5, f4. Alright. Yeah, you still got some tricks. Rook d8. Um. Yeah, I think you've got too focused. You've got too much tunnel vision on this one push. You can't play it just yet, right? Because then they're going to trade and deflect your rook. Mm -hmm. And you won't have the pin anymore. You could just take, though. And if they take with the rook, now this does work. Yeah. That, yeah, I was so close. I guess, actually, it's it's tricky. You're still worse here, believe it or not. Your knight is hanging. Takes, takes. You should be able to hold a draw here, though. Like, king f7, rook c6. They're going to take there, you're going to take there, and their king is a bit more active, but it should be a draw. Nice. Knight d3, and this is where things start to really turn. Uh, I haven't paid that much attention to it because he had such bigger issues with this rook being out of the game. Um, he is up a very strong pass pawn here. Yeah. And we're going to see that that's going to become a big issue. This is what's called an outside pawn majority. He has three on two over here. Why do you think we're calling these pawns the pawns that are outside? Because they're away from the center? Because they're away from the king. Oh, I understand. Whichever that. side the kings are on, generally, that's uh, that's the side of the board that you have a quote-unquote outside pass pawn on. I understand. Because in the end games, uh, the kings become useful, and they become like a key player in, in just the fight for whatever's going on on the board. And for that purpose, whatever side the kings are on, the other side is where the outside pawn majorities are. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, like, for instance, imagine your king was here. It would be so much easier to deal with this pawn then. Like, yeah. they could advance it down the board. You might have some problems, but compared to this, it would be a piece of cake. So king f8, knight c5. You really love this knight c5 move. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> At this point, I kind of could feel that if this one's... I had no idea what to do. The tide is starting to turn. Yeah. My general plan had fallen apart and I was flailing. Yeah, um, so he played, you played c3. He missed a, an amazing opportunity. He took here. I would have played b3 if I were him. Because b3, he has a very simple plan. a4, a3, and just run this pawn through. And you can't take here because of the trick. Yeah. That would have been nice. We'll send him a message after. Yeah. Yeah, you could let him know. <laughs> yeah. He must have died. <laughs> <laughs> you missed it. <laughs> Um, alright, he took your... Unfortunately for you, you're losing anyway. Yeah. A4, king f2. Um, the going logic here is that you need to blockade this pawn as soon as possible. It would be ideal if you could put a rook here immediately. Yeah. Because the, 
it's always going to be ugly, but the longer you wait, the more critical it's going to become. I mean, yeah, we'll say that it becomes pretty bad. The whole idea is that if you, you keep your rook here, then technically your rook could get active and do something else and quickly come back to, to the pawn in yeah. time to stop it. In the game, you let your rook go here, in which case you're not going to have anything to do with your rook without it costing you, allowing him to make a queen. King f2, a3, g4, a2, king e3, bishop e1, king d4, rook d8, king c4. It's rook. over. Yeah, this is just done. Your rook is buried alive. Yeah, it's over. Knight d4. I make my... Yeah, I wasn't even... I knew it was over. <laughs> um... Cool. Uh, yeah, these were some interesting games.